today what I want to talk about is storytelling because storytelling is a big thing in my family we have done it for hundreds of years now I'm telling you this story today from inside this old-fashioned caravan and this is the type of caravan that the old storytellers used to live in but they weren't just storytellers they were story makers they made new stories up but they also made toys to go with them and I was very, very lucky growing up because they taught me to tell stories, but they also taught me how to make the toys. Now, I want to show you some of those toys. Then I want to tell you one of my favorite stories about those toys and maybe even show you the character from that toy. But well, first of all, I'd like to show you a piece of willow. Now, it looks just like a stick. That's because it is a stick, but it's off a very special tree called willow. Willow is amazing because it grows almost everywhere. Doesn't mind the weather. If it's windy, it just bends with it. If it rains a lot, which it does sometimes in the north of England, it just loves the rain. And what my family used to do was to make things like this, old fashioned clothes pegs from a piece of willow. So you can see how that would come from that. But how does it become a toy? Well, in the old days, there wasn't that many toy shops and people didn't have that much money. So they would take something like this, a stick, a piece of willow, a clothes peg, and they would paint it, maybe put some wool on the top for hair and turn it into a lovely toy. And I know you have some amazing toys these days, but look, there's one of the toys that we would make. Sitting up straight now for Sergeant George William. Now, we would move on from that and get bigger pieces of willow. And here's quite a large piece of willow. But what could we make from this? Well, again, I was very lucky, as I said, and I learned how to make rolly toys. This one is for children who like to roll things across the floor. This one's called Rolly Yoli, and it's a bit funny, and it has two faces. So whichever way it rolls, you will be able to see its face. I really like Rolly Yoli. But then I started to make what I call the tree buddies. And these tree buddies, they can hang in the trees and they can blow in the breeze. So I want you to remember that. The tree buddies, they hang in the trees and blow in the breeze. Now let's get on to our main story, which is about an older couple. And this older couple, they lived in a little old cottage in Yorkshire, probably not far from where you are now. And this little old couple, they lived in a lovely little old cottage. It was the old days, so everything was quite simple. But they were very happy together. They had a lovely little cottage. They had a lovely bed. They had a lovely sofa. They had a lovely table and chairs, a little old kitchen. They had everything they could want. And the woman, Mary, she used to make things out of material. She could make you just about anything you wanted in terms of clothes or anything for your home. And the man, George. Now, George, and everybody used to call him Geordie, but George used to work on a farm. Very, very hard work outdoors in all kinds of weather, but he loved it. He loved looking after animals and he loved growing crops. And he worked at the same farm for a long time. And almost every day he'd leave the little cottage and go up the old fashioned farm lane from the village up to the farm and do his day's work and then come back home again. One particular day, he said goodbye to Mary, and he was walking up this country lane towards the farm and coming the other way was a young man and a young woman pushing a big old fashioned cart with those big old cart wheels on it, almost like a, a barrow, but about four times the size of a wheelbarrow big old-fashioned wheels and it's trundling down the lane and it's piled up and he's not quite sure what's underneath the pile up because there's a cover covering everything and Geordie was in the way and he said good morning and the young couple said good morning and he said I'm really curious what's underneath that cover and they said ah toys pieces of wood some tools and toys you see we are toy makers and we travel around from place to place and we go to markets and we go to village squares we go to town centers and we sell our toys and people come along and that's how we make our money to live <gasps> sounds interesting said Jory. do you mind if i have a look of course not said the young couple and they peeled back the cover and underneath Jordy could see bits of wood tools but the most beautiful toys and some of these toys the arms and the legs moved on them he said oh those are amazing they said would you like to buy one Jordy said well you see unfortunately i don't have any children 
and therefore I don't have any grandchildren, so really I've got nobody to buy it for. Well, that's a shame, said the young couple. But you know what? These toys, like a lot of toys, they're not just for children, they're for adults too. And in fact, we could make you the perfect toy for you and your wife. Wouldn't that be nice to have some company, to have a toy that would be some company for you in your home? Geordie thought about it and he thought, do you know what? It would. He said, how much would it be to make this particular toy? And the toy makers thought about it and they said, well, how much have you got in your purse at the moment? And Geordie took out his old fashioned purse and he opened it up and he had one gold coin and two silver coins. And the young couple said, actually, that's just the right amount of money. Now that's all the money that Geordie had, he'd been saving that for quite a while, but he thought, if I'm going to get something that's going to make our home nicer, why not? So he took the money out and he gave it to the people. And he went off to his day's work. And when he came home that afternoon, Mary was busy working, doing some sewing for somebody. And he rushed in and he said, Mary, 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 guess what, guess what? I've bought us something, something for our home. It'll be really good company for us. And Mary said, what is it? He said, I met these toy makers and I've ordered this toy. I bought this toy. It was quite expensive, but it's going to be great. Mary said, where's the toy? He said, well, um, I've ordered it. She said, from who? He said, well, from these toy makers. She said, well, where do they live? He said, um, I don't know. She said, well, when are they going to bring it to? He said, well, they said about five days. She said, do you did you tell them where we live? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I told them which cottage we are near the big sycamore tree and on the edge of the village and that. She said, but you have gave them the money and you haven't got the toy. Oh, Geordie, I think you've been tricked. How do you know that those people are going to bring it? Geordie felt a bit stupid then. He said, well, I don't. He said, but they seem quite nice and everything. She said, but you don't know them at all. How do you know they're going to? Oh, Geordie, never mind. Look, you're a very honest, trusting person and we've lost quite a bit of money, but, you know, it's OK. We'll get used to it. We'll get over it. Geordie was very sad about that and he sat down and he didn't really want his tea that evening. He thought, I've been a real fool, haven't I? I've given all my money for something I couldn't even see and probably not even going to get. Well, Geordie went to work the following day and the day after and the day after. And it was about five days that we just sat down having their tea. Thoughts of this toy and being ripped off for the money were long gone. But they're having their tea and there was a knock on the door. Geordie went to answer it. And there was the young man and the young woman, the toy makers, in a big bag, big old fashioned sackcloth bag. I said, hello, we brought your toy. Geordie went, uh, 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 uh. the toy makers said, did you think we wouldn't bring it? Geordie decided to tell the truth. He said, well, I did. He said, I, I, I just, I'm sorry, but I, you know, you, I didn't know where you came from or where you were going or who you were. And they said, but we always, when we make a promise, we always deliver things. Inside this bag is the toy we've made for you. Now, it may look a little bit familiar, okay? But what we want you to do is make sure you treat this toy as if it were a part of your family. Allow it to sit on the sofa. Allow it to sit at the table when you're having something to eat. Mary shouted, Geordie, what's going on? <clears throat> Geordie said, Mary, look, 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 look. I've got the toy. And as he waved goodbye to the toy makers, he took the toy out of the bag and Mary went, oh, it's well worth the money. It's beautiful. She said, he looks like you. I'm going to call him Little Geordie. Come on, Little Geordie, come and sit down on the sofa with us. And from that day on, Little Geordie went everywhere with them down to the shops. At first, the neighbours thought, oh, that's a bit strange, but soon they would say, hello, little Geordie, how are you? But of course, this wooden toy never said anything back. It was just a wooden toy. They'd sit it on the sofa, they'd sit it on the chair at mealtimes. They took it everywhere with them. And everything was great. They were very happy until one day, Geordie was walking up towards the farm as usual. Mary was at home sewing for money as usual. Geordie got halfway up the farm lane the farmer came down. He didn't look very happy. In fact, he looked quite sad. Geordie said, what's the matter? One of the animals got out or something. What's going on? The farmer looked down like this and he said, look, Geordie, he said, I'm really sorry. He said, but, um, you know, my son's getting bigger and machines are getting popular now. And we've decided to buy a machine and my son is going to run that. And we don't really need you on the farm anymore. I've got you some money here, wages. 
two weeks wages he said to tide you over till you find a new job he said i'm really sorry but things have changed and we've all got to move on geordie just could hardly speak he took the money and he said well okay then and he walked home and when he got back in mary said oh you're home from work early what's up and he told her and they were both really sad about that but mary was one of those people one of those really clever women and she wouldn't let geordie just sit there and moan and mope she said tomorrow morning Listen, you are a very, very good worker. You're very clever. You've got lots of skills. Tomorrow morning, get up nice and early. Walk through to the other side of the village. There's a few farms over there. Go and see if they need any help. And that's what he did. But when he came back round about lunchtime, I had to tell Mary, same story. Other farms were getting machines. Nobody wanted an extra farm worker. She said, don't worry. Get on your bike tomorrow morning and cycle right across from the village almost to the city she said there's a lot of farms there Jolie did exactly that came home later in the afternoon same story mary i'm afraid he said nobody wants an extra person things have changed she said well you might have to change your job she said you're strong you're clever do you know at the other side of the city where the river runs through she said there's these things called docks where the ships come in and they go out there's loads of people need to load and unload the things off the ship it's called cargo you should get on your bike and get to the city tomorrow and just see if there's any work for you there's bound to be some work along there and that's what Jody did he got on his bike and he cycled towards the city and as he went through the city square it was so quiet there was a few people opening their shops there's just pigeons in the city center one or two people walking around but he just pushed his bike quietly through the city center got to the other side got to the river got to where all the docks and the ships were it was really noisy there was lots of people but everywhere he went to ask for work same thing machines were coming in they needed less people not more Jody was really, really sad as he pushed his bike back through the city centre. But this time the city centre was full. It was loads of people. And there was a crowd of people who were laughing and cheering. And Jody could hear the sound of well, the sound of money being dropped on a hard surface. The sort of ringing of money. Jody was really, really intrigued. And he, he looked at the crowd and he thought, I wonder what's going on. And so he still had his bike and he leaned it up against something. And he started to move his way through the crowd. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Till he got to the front. And when he got to the front, he saw that there was a man and a woman and they had puppets on strings. And the puppets were doing funny things. And the man was saying things, telling stories. And the people would applaud and the adults would throw money. There was so much money there was a big hat next to them and it was overflown with money Jody couldn't believe it he watched and he watched and he watched until the crowd went away and he walked up to the man and the woman and he said this is amazing i've never ever seen so much money for something like this do you think i could be a puppeteer like you the man and the woman looked at each other then looked at Jody and said a lot of people say that but it takes a lifetime to get this good you can have a try if you like Jody picked up one of the puppets, but within a few seconds, all the strings and the legs and the arms were all tangled up. And he tried again and the same thing happened. He said goodbye to the people and he got on his bike and he went back home. But he told Mary, Mary all about it. And he said, Mary, 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 you wouldn't believe how much money. And, and it was just amazing. She said, well, you could do that. He said, I tried. I can't. It just takes a lifetime. He said, my hands are really big, you know. He said, and, and the strings. And he said, I just couldn't do it. She said, listen. Go and get little Geordie. I've got an idea. And go and bring that old handle from the broom that we don't use anymore when we got the new one. Piece of wood about that long. Geordie said, OK. She said, now fix that to little Geordie and let's see what happens. And he did. He fixed the broom handle to the back of little Geordie. She said, tomorrow you must go down to the town, take a little stool, do what the puppeteers did. Try and have some fun, entertain people, take your hat, put it down and see what happens. Well, he was really nervous, as you are when you try something new. He thought, I'm not a puppeteer, I'm a farm worker, but I've got to give it a go. I've got to be brave. And he went and he sat in the town, he put his hat down, he sat on a little stool and he got the puppet and he moved it up and down with the stick, but nobody was really interested. And then a little girl with her family walked up. She stopped and she looked and she smiled and she started to move. And then other people came 
and a few people threw a few pennies. Jordy went home that afternoon, very, very pleased, and said to Mary, look, 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 I got a few pennies. She said, well, you're going to have to learn to get better at it, aren't you, and do even more. So he went to another town in a few days' time, and this time he practised, and he was even better. And eventually he kept going to more towns, and before long, he and the puppet were famous all over the north of England. He was earning much more money than he'd ever earned on the farm, and he was having so much fun doing it. Now you're probably wondering, well, what did that puppet look like? What did little Geordie look like? Well, I could try and explain it, couldn't I? But I think what would be better if I actually found him and brought him out. Now, he doesn't always listen to me. I know most children do listen to their parents and the people they work with at school and things, but little Geordie sometimes, little Geordie, could you come out please? Don't make too much noise. Oh, by the way, he likes to dance. Do you like to dance? If you do like to dance, would you join in when he dances? Right, I'll bring him up. Little Geordie, come out for me. Now, the other thing is, if he messes about, you need to tell me. Okay, little Geordie, here he is, here he is. Can you see him? Can you see little Geordie? Here he is, right. Put your hands down. Are oh, you saying hello? He's saying hello to you, right? Put your hands down, right? Okay, right. Now, I'm just going to say something over here because I know you like a little bit of music and to dance, but whatever you do, don't move, okay? When I'm talking to the families and the children here, don't move, okay? So the good thing about him is he won't move when I'm talking. He didn't move there, did he? Did he? No. If he moves, shout out he's moving. If you'll do that for me, that would be really useful, okay? Right, because he won't move, I know that, because he listens to everything. I, I saw you doing that. Now, are we ready? He likes a bit of music. So I'm going to get this here, and let's see if we can... Oh, yeah, it works, okay? So I'm going to move him up and down. Can you see him moving? Can you see him moving? No, no, slow down. Don't go, don't go too fast. Don't... It's a tendency sometimes to go a little bit too fast. So if you just tell him to just slow down a little bit. Or maybe you're a fast dancer. Maybe you might be there shouting, go faster, go faster. I'll soon know because he'll dance faster if he hears you. Here we go. Right. Right, you've got the music right. Okay, we'll do a little song first, okay? And it goes like this. It goes. You might want to clap along. It goes. Can you dance, little Jody? Can you dance all around? Can you dance through the village? Can you dance through the town? Can you dance, little Jody? Can you dance real fast? Can you dance, little Jody, with the bonny last right now? No, just calm down. Don't go too fast, okay? I'll give him a bit of music now. Would you join in with the dance for us before we finish? We'll finish with this lovely dance, okay? You ready? <laughs> No, no, not the sw not the swinging leg. No, 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 no. Calm down. We'll do it a bit quieter. Okay. Now sit down now, and it's time for us to finish, boys and girls and mums and dads. I hope you've had a really, really good time, and I'm looking forward to reading you the bedtime story tomorrow. Okay. So it's goodbye from me, Richard O'Neill, storyteller and author, and it's goodbye from Little Jordy. Goodbye. I'm going to read one of my favourite bedtime stories, which just happens to be one of my books too. Now this is a book that I wrote uh, about a pit pony called Polonius and the fabulous illustrations are by somebody called Feronia Parker Thomas. Many years ago ponies like Polonius worked below ground in coal mines pulling heavy metal tubs filled with coal. Pit ponies spent most of the year in the mines working and sleeping underground. But every year the mines shut down for a holiday and the ponies were brought up to eat fresh grass and breathe fresh air. They were always excited to be outside and were soon galloping and frolicking, enjoying the freedom. Polonius noticed two big horses grazing nearby, some caravans, on the other side of the fence. As he got closer, he could see they weren't tethered and there were no fences keeping them in. Why don't you run away? he asked. Oh, why would we, little pony? said Cushy, puzzled. We're part of a travelling family. We always have the best grass. We can drink from the river and swim in it when it's hot. I wish I could join you, said Polonius. Cushy let out an amused whinny. <laughs> You're far too small to pull one of our heavy wagons or working carts. You'd only be any good for pulling a tiny little cart at a horse fair. Besides, 
snorted Thor. There are no stables even in the winter. You're nowhere near tough enough for a life of travelling the roads. After their break in the open air, it was time for the ponies to go back down the pit. None of them wanted to return to the dark and dusty mine, and rounding them up was quite hard work. It's now or never, thought Polonius. In the commotion, he escaped through the gap in the fence. The travelling woodcarvers had moved on, but Polonius followed the horses' tracks and soon found their new camp next to a sawmill. When the children saw the pony, they leapt up and surrounded him. One of the girls, Lucretia, instantly fell in love. But Grandad frowned. He's a pit pony, he said. Just look at his mane and tail. He'll have to go back where he belongs. As soon as they walked back to the noisy pit yard, the little pony started to stamp his feet and buck and shy. Shh, soothed Lucretia. Grandad found the horsekeeper Brian and explained what had happened. He won't be any good for pit work now. He's tasted freedom, said Brian. Why don't you keep him? No charge. Grandad shook his head. I don't need another animal to look after, my friend. A pony like him wouldn't be much use to us. I'll even throw in a leather harness, Brian said. I can't keep a pony that won't go down the pit. Please, Grandad, I'll look after him, said Lucretia. I'm sure he'll be useful somehow. Oh, go on then, said Grandad. Polonius took to the travelling life straight away. He dealt with the winter cold and the days when food was scarce. No one had ever cared for him the way Lucretia did. When the day's work was finished and the family shared their stories around the fire, talking proudly about their horses. Thor pulled a heavy cart full of alder logs today, said Jasper, all the way up the hill from Harper's Woods to the sawmill. The new truck got stuck in the muddy field. Luckily, Cushy pulled it out, said Leander. Little Rosie tickled Polonius's nose today, laughed the Crucia, but he didn't make a fuss. Polonius was pleased that the family thought he was gentle, but he desperately wanted to be a hero like Cushy and Thor. The whole family was working on a huge order of painted alder wood stools that were going to be shipped to America. It was a big job and the stools were only just finished on time. Everyone helped load them onto Dad's new truck, ready for him to drive to the docks the next day. We'll set off early and stop halfway for some food and a sit down, said Dad. We should get to the docks in the afternoon, he added. There'll be plenty of time to deliver the stools before the ship sails. The family slept soundly and woke at dawn as usual. But when Dad came out of his caravan, he saw that a blanket of dense fog had descended on the valley. Grandad walked down the lane to see if it was as foggy away from the camp. He returned looking worried. I can hardly see a hand in front of me. There's no way I can risk driving the big truck on these narrow country roads in fog this thick. One false move and we're off the road, or worse, the bridge, said Dad. Besides, added Grandad, you'd have to drive so slowly we wouldn't get there in time anyway. Grandad tried to calm everyone down. It's okay, we'll find a way. We always do. Let's load the stools onto my cart instead. Cushy or Thor can pull it. The family formed a chain and passed the stools down from the truck, making sure they were all safely stacked and roped onto Grandad's cart as quickly as possible. But the big horses were stamping their feet and flaring their nostrils. When Grandad tried to lead Cushy towards the cart, she wouldn't budge. The same thing happened with Thor. Now even Grandad was struggling to remain calm. They're scared of the fog. What are we going to do? Polonius could pull the cart, said Lucretia. He doesn't seem scared. If he could find his way down the pit, I'm sure he could find his way in the fog. Full of hope once more, 
they quickly put a harness on Polonius and backed him into the cart. But it was much too heavy for the little pony. Polonius, however, had a plan. He trotted over to Cushy and Thor. We can do this together, he said. If you pull the cart, I'll stay alongside and guide you. Look, said Lucretia, Cushy is following Polonius. The family watched in awe as the little pony encouraged the big horse to back into the cart. Polonius stood next to Cushy, nuzzling the trace hook. Looks like Polonius is going to be our guide, laughed Grandad. I think you better come too, Lucretia. So Grandad, Lucretia, the big horse and the little pony set off down the lades toward the main road. Cushy was still scared, but Polonius was thrilled at the chance to take the lead. Just keep calm and we'll be fine, Polonius told Cushy. Trust me. Polonius used all the skills he'd learned in the pit. With his feet, ears and nostrils, he made sure they all stayed safe. The brave little pony talked Cushy through every step, explaining how he was finding his way. Grandad kept looking at his watch. He was worried they wouldn't make it to the docks on time. He knew if he had to let the horses stop for some food soon, though. Lucretia squeezed his hand. It'll be all right, Grandad. To their surprise and delight, the fog started to lift just as they finished their food. Come on, we can do it, Polonius cried. Now Cushy could see more clearly, the wagon started to pick up speed. As the fog cleared even more, Grandad and Lucretia had to jump onto the cart in case they got left behind. We can do it, go as fast as you can, Polonius sang. The big horse started to pound the road faster and faster, her huge hooves beating out a furious rhythm. She kept the precious load safe, but it was like they were flying towards their destination. Soon they could hear the seagulls screeching. Their first sight of the docks was the huge metal cranes towering over them. We're here, shouted Lucretia joyfully. It didn't take them long to find the ship, unload the stools and get paid. We did it, thanks to you, Polonius, Cushy said admiringly. The following night and for many nights to come, the only story told around the fire was of Polonius and the heroic journey to the docks. His story is still told this day to remind people what's important isn't your size, but the determination and courage that you show. I hope you enjoyed that story. This is Richard O'Neill saying goodbye, goodbye.